A friend of mine runs the How Money Works YouTube channel. Let's call him the How Money Works guy or dollar question mark. He's a retired tech investment banker in his 20s living in San Francisco, but he's not originally from San Francisco and he doesn't really need to live there anymore. We were speaking recently about where he should live as a YouTuber and newsletter writer who can really work from wherever he wants to, but it's not that easy a problem to solve. So I decided to help him out and maybe help some of you who are thinking of moving by making this video, analyzing home prices around the world and adjusting them for income opportunities and various costs you would incur as a homeowner and resident in the different locations. Let's look at what you get for your money globally and try to find dollar question mark a good place to live. Now, the population of California, where he currently lives, has been falling since 2020. And a big reason for this is that California is expensive, both in terms of real estate prices and state income taxes. As Californians have been moving, they've been filling the internet with memes, comparing the kind of house you can buy in Texas, where they all seem to be going, led by Joe Rogan, versus what you would get in California for the same price. And you get a lot of home for your money in Texas. The menswear guy, one of the big accounts on Twitter, who also lives in California, chimed in on this topic last week when looking at two $2.7 million homes. He commented that there was a risk of becoming lonely in the huge Texas home that was so much larger than the Californian one. We might even be able to solve that problem in this video too. You could just buy a smaller house in Texas and put the extra $2 million that you saved in the bank, maybe even spend some of the interest income on organizing dinner parties. Your loneliness problem is now solved. We of course have to take more into account than just the price of a home. While we might be able to find a big cheap house in a war zone, for example, you might find it noisy and stressful, and you might not even speak the local language. Your lifestyle is going to matter a lot too in deciding where to live. Some people would prefer to live downtown in a vibrant city. Others would prefer to live in the calm and quiet of the countryside. For most people, the availability of work and networking opportunities in their career of choice will matter quite a lot. A quick way of comparing different locations to each other would be to look at the ratio of average home prices to average household income in different cities. You shouldn't be too surprised if a home in a city where you would earn twice as much also costs twice as much. You're paying up for the opportunity to earn a high income, have an exciting career, and be around people with similar incomes and educational backgrounds as you have. There will be all sorts of cultural amenities for you to enjoy, but you'll have to pay to live near them. You'll need to adjust this calculation for taxes and other expenses you may encounter based upon the location you choose too. If you earn more in a given location, but the extra earnings all go on taxes, that's not really a win. Other things that you'll need to adjust for are the different expenses you might be faced with. In the United States, citizens might pay lower taxes, but have to spend more on health insurance than in Europe. In some cities, there may be great public schools that parents are happy to put their kids in, while in other locations, they might find themselves paying for private schools. When comparing buying a large Texas home to a smaller one in California, you need to consider the additional cost associated with heating and air conditioning, all of that extra square footage. You need to take into account the additional maintenance and repair costs that you'll face too. Extra bathrooms will mean more plumbing fixtures that will eventually need repair. If the bigger house has a swimming pool, a huge garden, and is too big to clean on your own, you'll need to take into account all of the additional expenses you'll incur by buying the bigger home. How Money Works is a fancy guy. He's not going to do his own gardening. Okay, so let's look at American cities and how they compare in terms of home prices to income ratios. Then look around the world to see how different countries compare. We'll look at some quality of life measures and discuss why people choose to live where they do. 
Before we get to that, let me tell you about today's video sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day I wasted hours trying to cancel a software subscription service that I'm no longer using. This can be frustrating and feel like a bad use of your time. Well, today's sponsor, Rocket Money, is here to help. Rocket Money is an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. This personal finance app allows you to manage subscriptions, lower bills, build a custom budget and grow your savings all in one place. It safely and securely identifies recurring charges and cancels unwanted subscriptions for you. It'll negotiate the types of bills like internet service that tend to drift up over time if you ignore them and allow you to set budgets and monitor your credit. To save more and spend less, join the 3.4 million members using Rocket Money. Go to rocketmoney.com slash Patrick or click the link in the description to get started for free or unlock even more features with premium. That's rocketmoney.com slash Patrick to get started for free. Get your money right. When we look at real estate in the United States, we see that the average American home trades at four times the average household income, but this varies quite a bit by state. Looking at the 10 most popular US states, we see that California is the most expensive at 6.2 times average Californian household income, and Illinois is the most affordable at two and a half times average Illinois household income. New York, the state, not the city, is average at four times income, and Texas is affordable at 3.2 times income. Going back to the Texas, California, or Joe Rogan comparison, the average home in Texas costs $300,000 and the average Texan household earns $94,000 per year. Californians earn 26% more than Texans, the average family earning $119,000 per year, but they pay on average $743,000 for a home, more than twice what Texans pay, putting them under considerable additional financial strain. They don't get to keep all of their additional income either. Being a higher earner will push you into a higher tax bracket for federal taxes. And in California, there are nine state tax brackets, ranging from 1% to 12.5%. There's an additional 1% mental health services tax on income exceeding $1 million, making the state's highest tax rate 13.3%. Remember, that's on top of federal taxes. The average Californian who has a household income of $119,000 per year will pay 6.5% of that in state taxes alone. There's no state income tax in Texas. In Texas, sales tax on all of the goods that you buy, or VAT, is 6.25%, and in California it's 7.25%, which pushes up your cost of living too. Texas homes are much bigger than Californian homes on average, and they are more spaced out from each other too. For the same budget, you'll get a home five times as big in Texas as you'll get for your money in California. That's why Joe Rogan now has all of that additional podcasting space. So let's adjust the family incomes in each of the top 10 most populous states by the average state tax and adjust the average home price for local property taxes, maintenance, utility costs, and home insurance headwinds. Here we come to a more nuanced story. Those 7,000 square foot Texas starter homes aren't going to clean themselves, and the two acres of landscaped gardens aren't going to weed themselves, and neither is how money works going to weed them. You'll need three air conditioners to keep the house cool, and in the million dollar plus home price range, you might not be skimming leaves from your own pool. Adjusted for maintenance costs on different average home sizes per state, and adjusted for income and property taxes, we find a much wider affordability range between the top 10 US markets. High taxes in certain states reduce families' net incomes much more than high maintenance costs increase the expense of owning a large home in the more affordable states. California becomes even more unaffordable once we take these factors into account. 
an individual earning the average state income finds themselves paying 9.1 times their after-tax income to own the average home in the States. Some states like Florida have low tax rates, but high real estate prices, meaning that one offsets the other and you don't really win much by moving there. Now, you might feel that living in a high-tax state gives you access to additional government services for the higher taxes you're paying. Education, police, healthcare services, better roads, things like that. If you feel that you get a lot of value for your tax dollar, then maybe living in a high tax location that's less affordable might still make sense to you. Okay, so what do you get when you look around the world? Well, it turns out that home affordability is much worse in Europe, with home price to household income ratios averaging at 6.8 times income being spent on the average home. Spare a thought for the Dutch, with home prices at well over 10 times family incomes. Ireland, where I grew up, is above the average at 7.3 times average income for the average home. When you start looking around the world, you sometimes find other government fees, stamp duties or sales taxes are incurred at 9% in places like Greece and Germany. This means that many Europeans don't start out with a starter home and then move to bigger and bigger houses over time. They typically rent until they can afford to buy a family home and then stay there for the rest of their lives. When we adjust European housing affordability for taxes which are typically higher in Europe and maintenance costs which are often lower in Europe as the homes are smaller, the situation gets worse. The Dutch find themselves paying almost 16 times their take-home pay to buy an average home. The Greeks come in at 4.3 times income, similar to what Americans pay. The UK is a bit of an interesting case. The average home in the UK costs 362,000 US dollars, while central London housing prices average to 1.6 million dollars. The average Londoner is thus paying almost 20 times their income to buy a home, a much higher multiple than the average Brit is paying. London accounts for an outsized share of Britain's economic output. According to John Byrne Murdoch in the FT yesterday, removing London's output and headcount from British statistics would show that the rest of the country is as poor as Mississippi, the poorest state in the United States. Okay, so let's look at other big cities around the world to try and find some affordability. Well, you won't find it in Shanghai, where whole families pool their wealth to buy a home. Shanghai house prices trade at 49 times average income. In Bangkok, people pay 31 times average income, and in Mumbai, people pay 30 times average income. In Sydney, it's 16 times, and Toronto, just on the border of the United States, they pay 12 times average incomes. Mexico City trades at 4 times average incomes. It's worth noting that in Shanghai, you pay 49 times average income and you own just the building, not the land it's built on. You get a 70-year lease on the land and then have to renegotiate that lease with the local government when it expires. Otherwise, you move out. It would appear that the Americans are doing okay. They're spending less of their incomes on housing than the rest of the world is, meaning that they have more to spend on other things. So do they live in much smaller homes then? No, they live in much larger homes. According to Sonia Hurt from the University of Georgia, the median size of an American home is 1,650 square feet, which is about 75% or 700 square feet bigger than the average home in the rest of the world. Australia, Canada and New Zealand have similarly sized homes to the Americans. The UK has some of the smallest houses in the world, at an average of 818 square feet. Only China, Russia and India are home to smaller properties. So in order to help how money works out, let's see what you can get for a million dollars in different parts of the world. OK, let's start where he is right now in San Francisco. It seems you can get a 1,400 square foot, 
two-bed, two-bathroom apartment with a condo fee of just under $8,000 per year. It looks okay, if a bit small, and they seem to be highlighting the prior owner bought something once at Louis Vuitton and has been storing the bag ever since. They also have two hat boxes. Um, I'll have to check with him if he has any hats that he needs to store. Let's try Manhattan next, a big financial centre. Well, we've got a two bed, two bath, a little bit smaller than the last one, but with a nice view of the East River. The condo fee is $43,000 per year, which seems a bit steep. Uh, you'd have to present value that cash flow to make it a fair comparison. Just to be clear, I'm just looking at the first million dollar apartment I see on the website. These aren't necessarily representative broadly. Okay, so Boston next, let's check out the Back Bay. We get a two bed, one bath, 925 square foot apartment in the Back Bay with a $9,000 annual condo fee. So far, San Francisco isn't looking so bad. Okay, let's check out Houston, Texas next. Houston is the fourth biggest city in the United States. Here we go, three bed, five bath, that's a lot of bathrooms, right downtown near the park with a two car garage. There's no swimming pool though, but it is 3,600 square feet, so about three to four times the size of the others we've looked at. And there is no condo fee. The Texans aren't paying a condo fee. Okay, let's try London next. A million dollars is around 800,000 pounds. Here we go, Kensington, that'll be nice. Oh, okay, it's above a shop and it's a two bed, one bath in what is described as a striking building. It does look like something struck it all right. The description says an attractive opportunity for a purchaser to add value and refurbish throughout to their own taste and style. I mean, what would you even change? This is his taste and style. They don't list the square footage, but it doesn't look very big. I mean, this one is, it, this is the obvious choice, isn't it? It just needs a bit of paint. Okay, okay, maybe we need to up our budget a little bit in London. One of the problems with comparing locations like this is that tourist locations will always look really expensive. Wealthy people will pay up for holiday homes in popular locations and people working in that location will be priced out. Cities like London, Paris and New York attract a lot of tourists and they are expensive places to live. But they also attract a lot of tourists because they are nice places and there are a lot of things to do there. Other tourist locations are tougher for the locals from an affordability perspective because they don't even have highly paid jobs like the big cities do. They just have expensive real estate. When we look at different cities around the world, you see that there is significantly different population density and that can affect quality of life too. The graphic on screen right now shows how much space the entire world's population would take up if everyone lived in the United States at the densities that people live in a variety of different cities. As you can see, Paris, New York and Singapore are very dense. The entire global population could live in Texas if it was as densely populated as New York City is. San Francisco has a lot more space, London even more, and Houston has the most space. People are spread out, filling up almost half of the United States. Things are spread out there. In Paris and New York, you don't really need a car, while having a car in Houston would be essential for getting around. So how do people weigh this type of information when deciding where to live? Well, they don't necessarily weigh it at all. Housing is a notoriously sticky asset and not everyone has the opportunity to move or the legal right to work and to settle as a permanent resident across various borders. In some parts of the world, like Singapore and the UAE, if you're a foreigner living and working there and you lose your job, you have to leave the country within 30 days unless you find a new job. In contrast to this, citizenship of some countries can be obtained by investing money in the local economy, buying real estate or securities, starting a business or creating jobs. It can cost as little as investing $100,000. As I said though, not many people do these things. 
In the United States, studies show that the typical adult lives only 18 miles from his or her mother, according to an upshot analysis of data from a survey of older Americans. Over the last few decades, Americans have become less mobile, and most adults, especially those with less education or lower incomes, do not venture very far from their hometowns. Only 20% of older Americans live more than a couple of hours' drive from their parents' home. Researchers often study the distance from mothers because women tend to live longer than men. The biggest determinants of how far Americans venture from home are education and income. Those with college and professional degrees are much more likely to live further away from their parents than those with a high school education, in part because they have more job opportunities in big cities. Wealthier people can also afford to pay for services like child and elder care and don't need to rely as much on their families. It appears that the more education a person has, the further from home they're likely to go. Since the pandemic, Americans appear to have widened their house hunt radius, moving further and further from their original homes. The median distance that buyers travel to their new homes was 50 miles in 2022, according to data published by the National Association of Realtors. That's more than three times the median distance moved in the last 30 years, which ranged from 10 to 15 miles. People moved to favorable weather, lower tax locations. They moved for more space, affordability, and a good job market, according to the National Association of Realtors. In a separate report from Realtor.com, more than 60% of house shoppers searched for listings outside of their metro areas in the second quarter of 2023. That's up 4.1% since last year. We can't wrap this up without talking about those quality of life indices that tell you you should move to cities like Vancouver and Vienna. These indices look at things like access to clean water, air quality, and claim to measure more subjective elements like a city's capacity to generate a sense of community. I don't have a good way of measuring a city's capacity to generate a sense of community. I can't even generate a sense of community in the comment section of my videos. Despite the fact that American cities are more affordable than other cities around the world and have larger dwellings, no American city cracks the top 10 of any of the most livable cities lists. From what I can see when looking at these rankings, some US cities other than their downtown cores, don't even qualify as cities under some of the metrics used, as the populations are not sufficiently dense. Public transport seems to be weighed heavily in deciding on quality of life, and then things like access to free healthcare and levels of incarceration are all metrics that do not favor US cities. Other reasons given for U.S. cities not making the rankings are fewer public services and less favorable work-life balance in the United States. Many of the highly ranked quality of life cities unfortunately have very expensive real estate relative to worker income, and being saddled with a huge mortgage may not exactly give people work-life balance. The top three cities for quality of life, Vienna, Copenhagen, and Melbourne, are all beautiful cities, but have average home prices at 11 times, 16 times, and 15 times average incomes, respectively. It's possible that these cities provide a very enjoyable place to live for wealthy people who can afford the expensive homes. When we look at a list of the 10 most visited cities in the world, Three of the ten are American cities, implying that despite the claimed low livability, people around the world are very willing to visit. Okay, so taking all of this research into account, where should my friend How Money Works live? I don't know, maybe Dubai? He's one of those flashy YouTuber types. He probably wants to live on one of those palm islands, hang out at malls buying designer goods, and maybe do some indoor skiing. That's just the kind of guy he is. A friend of mine was there a while ago and she told me that there are people on the beach who polish your sunglasses for five dollars. He's just the kind of guy who doesn't want to polish his own sunglasses. 
I think Dubai is the right place for him. He could get one of those money gun things that YouTubers have. I guess I'm saying that you can't make these decisions with a spreadsheet. You have to work out what's right for you. If you have any suggestions of great places to live or feel that I missed out on something important, let me know in the comment section. I'm sort of trying to build a community there. Uh, if you enjoyed today's video, you should watch this one next. Don't forget to check out our sponsor, Rocket Money, using the link in the description below. See you in the next video. Bye.